Hello and welcome to the podcast. My name is Max Winnaker. I'm your host of Management 101. Uh, today we're going to be talking about managing low performers. Uh, first, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to a former direct report of mine, Molly Rint. She had the idea for this episode. Uh, it's something that I, I've talked a lot about with my former direct reports and uh, I think it's a pretty universal experience to be managing an underperformer. So let's get right into it. Not everyone is going to be in the right rules for themselves at all times in their career. This could be for a bunch of different reasons. Uh, one, they may not be in the right headspace and therefore they are not delivering despite being capable of doing so. Two, they haven't had proper expectations set for them and therefore they just don't know that they're not delivering. Or three, they just may not have the skills needed for the role and therefore they simply can't deliver. Um, any of these three situations can make someone an underperformer. Now, having an underperformer on the team can be a managerial nightmare if it's not dealt with appropriately. Today, what we're going to do is we're going to talk through how to manage underperformers effectively. And uh, don't worry, you do not necessarily have to fire them, uh, at least not yet. We've got some uh, potential ways in which you can bring them up to an acceptable level of performance. First step, let's identify underperformers. Sometimes this is obvious. Uh, simply the quality of their work is below what you would expect to see. An example, they do analysis that is raw or more basic than it should have been. Another example, maybe they are in charge of a process and they make repeated errors running that process. Sometimes it's not as obvious. Uh, you might hear, for example, from a stakeholder that this person isn't communicating well or delivered their work in a suboptimal way. You might also hear concerns or frustration from team members that work with this individual. Um, there are a lot of ways to identify underperformers, but and now let's talk a little bit through how those individuals can impact you and uh, well beyond you, in fact. So an underperformer, the obvious impact is that they're just not doing what they're supposed to do. And therefore, you look bad as the person who's ultimately responsible for their work. I've had many examples where a boss has questioned my team's work or my abilities as a leader simply because one person on my team was doing a bad job. Uh, what you may not realize is that your team and the company are also affected. The team is affected in, in the sense that low performers can really drain morale. Top performers can feel like they're being dragged down uh, and they might also feel like high performance simply doesn't matter if another person isn't performing well and this doesn't seem to be a problem to you or the organization, what's the incentive to perform at a higher, uh, higher level? And the company is also impacted. The reputation of low performers in a company travels a lot farther and a lot faster than the reputation of high performers. Employees tend to talk to each other, whether you realize it or not. If one person isn't doing their job and others are frustrated by or resentful of that, they're going to tell other people. I have personally had people not want to join my team because they knew of a low performer who they did not want to work with. And that person was already on my team. And uh, in, in the case that I'm thinking of, I didn't even hear about it until after the fact. So um, it. It can very well be impacting your team in ways that you do not realize and certainly do not know about. Now, there's this concept that a chain is only as strong as its weakest link, and that very much applies here. The worst performers are going to drag down everyone around. So I once ran a team whose role was to manage cross-functional projects that involved a lot of different teams. One of the things we had to do well was manage stakeholders. And we had one team member who was a very, very bad stakeholder manager. He was constantly upsetting other teams. Um, and this just really affected my entire team, not just him, because everyone on the team utilized these relationships that he was damaging. And he therefore made literally every other person on the team worse at their jobs. So now here's the million dollar question. What do you do about low performers? I'm going to talk through this from a couple different perspectives. And by a couple, I mean three. Um, so first, there's feedback. Second, there is performance management. And third, there is career development. So the way to think about these things is short, medium, and long term. Feedback is short term. You're telling someone right now what is going wrong in their work or their role. 
performance management is medium term. You're working with this person over weeks or months to get them to an acceptable level of performance in their role. And then career development is longer term. You're making sure that this person is developing the right skills for their role, as well as making sure that they're selecting the right role for their skills. Now, uh, let's start with feedback. On this podcast, we have talked about feedback a number of times. There's, in fact, a whole episode dedicated to it called How to Deliver Feedback. I know a very original title, but uh, at least it's easy to search. I've also had two guests on this podcast, Spencer and Matteo, both of whom I've discussed feedback delivery with at length. Uh, those are lots of great resources out there if you want to dive a little bit more into feedback. And I'm, I'm going to give one specific perspective on feedback as it relates to low performers. So one of the things that I think is critical to delivering feedback to someone who is performing below expectations is that it needs to be put in appropriate context for their role. To me, there are three types of constructive feedback, and they're all delivered a bit differently. The first and most basic one is tactical feedback. These are very basic things that need improvement. So an example would be better grammar and written communication. Now, this is something that's pretty minor, but is something that can be improved and therefore makes someone better at their job. The next bucket of constructive feedback is a growth enhancer. So in, in a, the example of a growth enhancer, this isn't necessarily something holding someone back or something that they're doing poorly in their role right now. But if this individual wants to advance in their career, this is something they're going to have to focus on or develop. So doing this thing well will take this individual much farther in advance in their career. One of the often used examples of a growth enhancer uh, that I am familiar with is presentation skills. So someone who is able to conduct a meeting and communicate necessary information to others will have a lot more success in their future role. So that's an example of a growth enhancer. And the third, and this is the most relevant one to low performers, is a growth blocker. A growth blocker is the area of feedback where someone is doing something or not doing something that's causing them to be unsuccessful in their role. In the example I gave before, this growth blocker would be called stakeholder management. If this individual can't improve on their stakeholder management capabilities, they're not going to be successful in their role and they're risking getting fired. Uh, so this is very much a growth blocker um, or a success blocker. When delivering this type of feedback, one thing to make sure of is that you're setting aside time away from your normal one-on-one -on -one to talk through this. Hopefully you already have some sort of regular development check-in with your direct report, but if not, you could either schedule time or you could extend a regular one-on-one -on -one to a longer time block, and then just let the person know in advance that you'd like to review feedback with them. In the discussion, I like to start off with just a reminder to my team member that I, as their manager, am here to support them and that it is in my best interest that they're as successful as they can be. Uh, the reason I do this is I, I want to make sure that they're not um, hearing this feedback from me as uh, uh, it's me versus them. It's the two of us versus the problem, which is we need to figure out how to get them to improve in this area. And they want I want them to see me as an ally. The next thing I do is I reiterate expectations of the role. In this case, and this is a totally theoretical example, I might say something like, one of the skills that is necessary for success in our team is effective stakeholder management. We work with a lot of teams who we don't have direct control over, but whose support we need to deliver on our commitments. Being able to build good relationships with those teams and work well with them is really important to making that happen. So now you've set expectations and hopefully it's just a reminder to them of what the expectations already are because you're an awesome manager and you have set expectations for the role from the very beginning. Uh, and then the next step would be to communicate that they are not meeting these expectations. I might say something like, I have observed and received feedback from other teams examples recently where I think your stakeholder management could have been much more effective. I wanted to bring them to your attention so you have the same information that I do, and then we can figure out how to best move forward. I just want to be clear that I'm not intending to accuse you of anything. I am just sharing these examples with you. 
And then I go into the specific examples. So here's one. One of the city ops team members who you recently worked with on a project told their manager that they felt you had taken total control of the project and were not listening to other team members' ideas or input. Now, it's important here to take a pause to let that person digest. Uh, it's likely that you are providing them a lot of critical information all at once. And it is easy to put someone on the defensive by doing that and then asking them to talk about it immediately. I would literally say that I'm pausing so they can digest. And then, you know, maybe after 30 seconds or a minute or whenever they say, okay, I've had a moment to think about this, I'd ask them if they had any questions about what I would communicated so far. And I'm, this is a really critical moment because you've delivered constructive feedback. The first is probably not feeling great. And so managing this effectively and keeping in mind the way that your words have made them feel is really important here. So then we move into the, the important part, which is communicating just how important this problem is. And this is where I see a lot of managers hold their punches a little bit, and maybe that's not the best expression, but, um, you, you want to, uh, you want to make sure they understand the gravity of the situation. So here's an example that I might use. Stakeholder management is one of the keys to success in this role. And in your case, I believe it needs to improve substantially in order for you to be effective. I will absolutely make sure that you have the space and support to improve in this area. I want to make sure I communicate to you that this currently is a blocker to your success and it will put your job at risk if not improved on. One of the keys here, and this is just to make sure that they are receptive to what you're saying and are not being put on the defensive, is separating the individual from the problem. Uh, I like to call out that uh, what I am communicating has nothing to do with them as a human being or as a person. It is simply a question of what's needed for success in this specific role, which is a job. Now, I want to help this person. I want to help you develop the necessary skills. But again, this problem does not reflect on who you are as a person. And hopefully that helps them see that what we're talking about here is the requirements for the job and not some failure of on their part as a person. So that's a little bit that we now talked about feedback. Um, the, that's the short term. So that's what we're doing right now. And now the next step is performance management. So what are we doing in the medium term to improve on this problem? If you just offer this feedback and then walk away, the likelihood that the end result is a good one is quite low. So feedback has now been delivered time to come up with uh, what is often called a performance improvement plan or PIP as it is uh, abbreviated oftentimes. I think the best way to do this is in written form. There are a lot of great resources on the internet for writing out performance improvement plans. Uh, this is really important for HR documentation purposes. If you ultimately need to let this person go, it is very important to have good documentation about what you've discussed and when. But the other key here is through writing this plan down, you can then have something to easily refer back to with this individual in future discussions. So a performance management plan should contain three parts. And again, there are lots of resources on the internet for, you know, the templates that this could look like, but the, the, the three parts are the most important, uh, no matter what it looks like. One, what's the problem that we're trying to solve? Two, what is the expected outcome? and the time frame in which we need this problem to be solved. And then three, the check-in plan to see how progress is going. Now, that last part is really important. It'll be important to come up with a check-in cadence. You don't want to simply leave this person out to dry. If this is not something they're good at already, it's likely they're going to need your help in improving it. Your role moves away from being just a manager and more into a coach in this situation. Of course, this team member has to perform much like an athlete has to perform, but you're there as the coach to help them focus on the right tactics, practice, if you will, and provide them feedback so that they know what's working and what isn't. In my experience, uh, for someone who is struggling in a particular area, I have found it helpful to set aside check-in time every one or two weeks for at least a month such that you can give ongoing feedback and also see how they're feeling. 
Um, these are really good opportunities to offer encouragement if you see improvement. There are also a time that you can call out examples if this problem is continuing to, to occur. And it's also um, a good way to just gauge how they're feeling about things. Um, there, there are people who will take this feedback and say, you know what, this is something I really want to get better at. And I'm going to work hard at it. And there are other people who are kind of skeptical of it and maybe don't grasp the urgency of it or just don't think that it's actually that important. Um, the only way to know that is by checking in with them. So either way, uh, whether it's going well or it's not going well, whatever the outcome, that person should know exactly where they stand in terms of their improvement or lack of improvement. And you do that through this check-in. Okay, so we've done these check-ins and now let's talk a little bit uh, longer term in terms of career development. Um, and this is unfortunately uh, where it comes time to per perhaps let people go from their roles. But I think that there's a more nuanced way of thinking about this. And that's what I'm gonna talk about here. Some people just end up in the wrong roles. Maybe they were promoted into a role that requires different skills than the one they were in previously. Maybe they changed roles as part of a reorganization. They might have thought they were being hired to do one thing, and it turns out that they were actually doing another. Either way, when someone ends up in the wrong role, the outcome is bad for literally everyone. That individual is stuck in a role that they're not good at. That really sucks. Uh, it's a total drain of energy to feel like you're working hard, but not getting good results. And of course, the team suffers as well. Like This person isn't doing a good job. This affects everyone around them who depends on their work, not just in terms of work quality, but also in terms of morale. Sometimes all the feedback in the world just isn't enough to make someone better at a job that they simply suck at. In those cases, I think it's important to focus on a critical question, which is, are they a bad fit for the company or are they just a bad fit for their role? There's a really big difference between those things. And I, you know, I have some thoughts here. This is certainly not the only way of thinking about it, but I'll give my perspective because approaching this in a thoughtful way can, can save a lot of heartache. It can really improve the performance of your team and your company over time. So what's the difference between being a bad fit for the company or just a bad fit for the role? When someone isn't performing well, it's generally a problem with either their hard skills or their soft skills. So a hard skill is something like process management or analytical skills. It's something you might go to school for, take a class in. A soft skill is something like stakeholder management or responsiveness to feedback. Hard skills are much easier to develop than soft skills. So if someone is simply lacking the appropriate hard skills, but is otherwise a wonderful member of the team with a great attitude and desire to learn, I tend to focus my career development discussions with them on finding a better fit for what they're good at. I once had someone in my team who had absolutely no Six Sigma or other formalized process training, but somehow in this team, they'd been thrust into a role where uh, they had been asked to develop standard processes that worked across a number of sites and a number of different people. And they were just doing a terrible job of rolling out these processes, but otherwise, uh, they were a really well-loved teammate and this person wanted to be doing a good job and demonstrated every interest in learning and improving. And they were in fact, very frustrated that they didn't feel like they were doing a good job. We ended up both agreeing that for sure, another role would make more sense for them. So I decided to move this person into another team of mine where they would be asked to focus more on a specific piece of the product that that person knew well as part of a larger team that developed those operational processes that this person was previously responsible for just on their own. Now, this person wasn't being asked to develop those processes end to end, but was just focused on a bunch of activities related to this product that they already knew really well. And almost immediately, this person became a much more impactful and happier member of the team. Soft skills can be a similar story. If someone is not good with people and they're asked to be in a role requiring a lot of stakeholder management, no training course is going to make them suddenly good with people. That's something you either kind of have or you don't. But maybe there are other rules where that person can do less people interaction and more work on their own. 
The major caveat though, with soft skills that doesn't uh, exist in the same way with hard skills necessarily is where it comes to attitude. I have had team members reporting to me who simply refuse to take responsibility for their actions. No matter how I tried to communicate the way that they were impacting others, they always had some excuse for why someone else was at fault. I would even give the very sort of like metaphysical feedback, if you will, that they need to improve on how they respond to feedback. So feedback about feedback, same story. And when someone has a bad attitude, uh, refuses to take responsibility for their actions or doesn't want to learn, they not only do not belong in their role, but they also do not belong in the company. Give them the opportunity to turn it around. Of course, you want to provide them that feedback and tell them, hey, this is uh, keeping you from being successful and, and ultimately could result in you being let go if it's not something you can improve. Um, but if they can't approve it, let them go. I do not think it's a good idea to try to move them to another part of the organization. I have experienced this where a manager who was not willing, didn't have the courage to fire someone, tried to find an individual, another role in the organization. Um, I've even been pushed by HR organizations to move someone rather than fire them because it's potentially less of a legal liability. It has always worked out poorly. And so someone has a bad attitude and isn't willing to learn, please don't pawn them off on another manager. So we talked now through feedback, uh, development conversations, and uh, overall career pathing. Let's talk through some, some typical mistakes that managers make as part of managing low performers on their team. Um, We've already talked about how low performers can have a far-reaching negative impact themselves. Uh, if they're not managed the right way, that impact gets much worse. So let's talk through some of these common mistakes. First, keeping someone around too long. I wrote these two stories in one of my blog posts titled, How One Asshole Can Kill a Whole Company's Culture, but I'll repeat them here because together they make a perfect parable. Um, when I joined uh, a, a team once, uh, I inherited an individual who was just at the end of their interview process with the team. They'd started long before I joined the team, and my manager asked me to more or less rubber stamp this person to join the team. I had heard some not so great things about their working style, but it had been a number of years and I wanted to give this person a chance. And I was under a lot of pressure to be hiring quickly. So I brought this person onto the team and Almost immediately, he started upsetting people. Uh, he upset multiple stakeholders. He uh, upset multiple members of the team. He was um, very uh, inconsiderate in the way he communicated and uh, made people feel as though their ideas were unimportant and he was in charge, despite uh, both of those things simply not being true. I was very lucky that uh, one of the stakeholders happened to be a good friend of mine, and she came to me and said, Hey, I just had this conversation with this direct report of yours, or actually he was reporting to a manager that was reporting to me. Um, I am very concerned about what he said during that conversation. Uh, the conversation led me to think that he actually has no idea what he's, uh, the way that he's supposed to be delivering work. And he also has no idea how to be working effectively with stakeholders. She gave me some examples that were just clear violations of normal stakeholder management best practices, things like yelling at stakeholders, which is, of course, just generally not acceptable in most professional settings, things like telling stakeholders that they were reporting to him, which was definitely not true, and um, also describing projects where very clear expectations had been set for him in ways that uh, really made no sense to, to others and, and indicated that he did not have a good understanding of his subject matter that he was working on, despite claiming during the interview process that he uh, was an expert in this area. So set aside for the moment, the fact that I hired him, that was definitely a mistake on my part, but uh, I let this go on for a couple months. Uh, his manager came to me multiple times and said, look, he's not improving. And I, I said, hey, my manager asked me to hire him. I think we need to give him a chance. We need to give him feedback. And um, it took two or three months to uh, eventually get to the point of deciding to let him go. After the fact, I learned a few things that were um, really 
big sort of like lessons learned for me. One, the team immediately improved its morale. People were visibly relieved when we told them that this person had been fired. Uh, that was, that was one indicator that this should have happened a long time ago. My own team was unhappy with this individual to the point that they were happy when they were let go. Um, that's a problem. Two, there were a number of stakeholders, uh, on our partner teams that were submitting critical feedback in our recurring surveys that my management team was looking at. They were submitting this feedback saying, Basically, it was really hard to work with my team and it was all related to this one individual. And I actually didn't know about any of this until one of my senior leaders came to me and said, Hey, your, your survey scores have really dipped, um, very badly with these few teams. And it turns out that these few teams were all working with this one person. Just between those two things alone, I think the big lesson learned for me was if this person is not demonstrating market improvement quickly when given very direct feedback, it's probably time to let them go. Same story, different outcome happened in one of my more recent jobs. I, I started full time. I inherited a team that had two managers in place. One of them that I was told by my boss the first day I joined was having a very hard time being a successful manager. When I joined, I talked to some of this person's direct reports and they literally in my first meeting with them, I'd never met them before, started tearing up, um, with frustration and uh, around how this person was managing the team. This person was simply being really disrespectful to individuals, not listening to them and also not doing very good work themselves. Since my boss had also warned me about this, I discussed with my boss sort of like, what should be the plan? I'd had this previous experience in mind where I was thinking, I don't want to have that again. If this is not going to go well, I want it to not go well quickly. So I built a performance improvement plan immediately, presented the set of feedback to this manager and said, basically, if this doesn't start improving in the next two weeks, um, I will ultimately decide to, to terminate your employment because being a successful people manager who has the trust and buy-in of their team is look, absolutely required for someone to be a successful manager. Um, fortunately, this manager sort of bought into the idea that that was important, um, but uh, almost immediately went on the defensive saying that everything was someone else's fault. Like the reasons that all these things were occurring were because of other people's actions, which to me was a big red flag from previous experience. And um, we had one-on-one -on -one almost every day for the next two weeks where we talked through examples of things that this person had done or have not done that were causing problems in the team, uh, coming up with ideas for corrective action. Ultimately, I did not see any improvement despite allocating a lot of my time to the problem. And so after two weeks, I checked with my boss. I said, hey, this isn't improving. I uh, don't think this is a good fit for this person on the team. And we agreed to, to let this person go. Uh, Lesson learned, basically, don't keep someone around for too long if they're not improving. I've heard the same story countless times. You know, in this case, I let this person go. And again, the team rejoiced. It was truly addition by subtraction. And I've heard the same story from a manager who has said, I regret not firing this person sooner. I cannot personally think of a time where a manager has said to me, I really regret firing this low performer and not giving them more chances. So. Lesson one, or mistake number one, keeping someone around too long as a low performer. Mistake number two, devoting too much time to your low performers. Low performers rarely turn immediately into high performers, and, and for the most part, they get to the middle of the pack at best. Bringing someone to the middle of the pack is better than having them perform poorly, but it's a lot less valuable investment of your time than enabling your top performers to be even better or to take on even more responsibility. Think about it as if you're constantly bringing up the rear, your team is going to be much worse off than if you just focus on helping your superstars get more effective. That's the best bang for your buck every time is dedicating your personal time and resources to your highest performers to get the most out of them. So even if you can get a low performer to an acceptable level of performance, and this is not high performing, this is just like acceptable enough to keep their job, they have to be able to achieve that level of performance without your ongoing involvement. 
Because otherwise, if you continue to have to be involved just to keep them in the middle of the pack, they're going to suck up a lot of your time to do just okay. And that time would have definitely been, been better spent elsewhere. So that's mistake number two, devoting too much time to your low performers. Mistake number three, not being clear enough with your feedback. I have had the personal experience of watching a manager be so nervous about being too direct with a member of their team that they softened the feedback enough to the point that the individual walked away having no idea that their job was at risk. Yes, it is possible that by being direct with someone, you are going to upset them. Uh, I personally have a hard time with this. I don't like knowing that I'm going to cause an emotional reaction in another person. So I completely understand the, uh, the difficulty that an individual might have in forcing oneself to be direct. It will be a much bigger problem though, if this person doesn't realize how important it is that they improve immediately. I promise it's worth ripping off the bandaid. One tough conversation now results in a lot fewer heartaches down the road. That's mistake number three, not being clear enough with your feedback. And then the last mistake, not seeing the warning sign. This is something I've personally uh, failed to do many times myself. You as a manager are probably going to be one of the last people in the team to spot that a person is doing a bad job. Uh, the individual teammates are going to notice it long before you do because they actively work with this individual on projects, whereas you're managing their their projects um, or their time. And when you start hearing even mild concerns about someone's work quality, either from team members of yours or from stakeholders, that's the moment to start digging in to see if there's really a problem. Where there's smoke, there's often fire. Do not wait until there's an active fire going on because at that point, it's possible you've lost trust of the team. It's possible this person has done either irreparable damage or damage that will take a long time to fix. It's better to dig in earlier and discover that there's not a problem than to wait to dig in until there's definitely a problem and have all this other stuff already have happened. So that's the fourth mistake is not, not seeing the warning signs or not acting on the warning signs. And just to go over those again, the four major mistakes managers make when it comes to low performers, one, keeping them around too long, two, devoting too much time to your low performers, three, not being clear enough with your feedback, and four, not seeing or acting on the warning signs. So that's my uh, hot take on managing low performers. Thanks so much for listening to this podcast episode. And if you're uh, ever interested in talking about a low performer of yours, uh, please feel free to reach out on LinkedIn or maxwenekerconsulting.com. I love to chat through these types of problems and I uh, really enjoy helping guide managers through what is ultimately one of the most difficult aspects of management, but if, if done right, can really bring your team to the next level. So hope you have a good rest of your week and uh, thanks for stopping by.